Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Eric Franzen, stepping in today for Shannon Kemp, who is on vacation this week. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, CDO Vision. This month, Tony Shaw is joined by guest speaker Anthony Algman, who will discuss getting started as a CDO. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDOVision, all one word. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Anthony Algman is the Chief Data Officer at the Chicago Transit Authority and was previously a Data Governance Managing Consultant, RGP, with deep experience in technology and business disciplines. Prior to joining RGP in 2014, Anthony served as the data governance practice lead for another strategy and management consulting firm in Chicago. He also spent over 12 years in the financial industry, performing technology development and leadership roles for data warehousing, business intelligence, trading, accounting, and back office operations. Anthony frequently speaks at national and local events, contributing thought leadership to the data governance and information management communities. Anthony has a BA from Illinois Wesleyan University and an MBA from Northwestern University. And moderating today's discussion is Dataversity's own CEO, Tony Shaw. Tony is, of course, responsible for the business strategy of the company and its subsidiaries, including Dataversity.net all of which conduct educational conferences, training, and publishing activities focused in the area of enterprise data management. And with that, I will turn things over to Tony to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, for those of you who've known me for a long time, you'll know that Eric and I have been colleagues for many years, um, uh, and so it's a pleasure to work with him again today on the webinar program. Uh, I'm particularly delighted to be welcoming, welcoming Anthony Algerman today. Um, I'm going to be referring to a presentation that Anthony did uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Data Governance Equality Conference in San Diego, and we're going to borrow some of the slides from that presentation to provoke our conversation today. But we're, we're mostly going to be having, uh, conducting this session in kind of an interview format. So, um, but the, the slides will give us a useful prop for, prop for some of that conversation. Um, I think you're all uh, in for a treat over the next hour because Anthony's uh, uh, a lively and amusing personality, and which is one of the reasons I invited him to participate with us today. So, Anthony, good to have you with us. Um, why don't we start just uh, with a little context? Tell us about uh, the CTA and um, and. Uh, let's, let's start there. Sure. Uh, Tony, thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here today. And uh, you know, I think from, from the Chicago Transit Authority, I mean, we do uh, the buses and the trains in the city of Chicago um, and some surrounding communities. Uh, we can trace our roots back uh, about 150 years. Uh, there's around 11,000 total people in the organization uh, with over a billion dollar budget, um, not including uh, capital uh, expenditures. and I think that just to kind of level set in the kind of organization that we have here, we have a, an organization that is doing a lot of things with heavy assets, with moving stuff around, and have a lot of different systems with a lot of different kinds of data, and have generally been operated in those silos. So we have separate operations departments and planning departments, and a lot of the information is kind of self-contained within those units and those um, Different units, those different systems do their job and do their jobs well, but there is a relatively early in the maturity cycle of uh, enterprise data. And so they knew uh, back um, you know, a year ago, I guess it was now, that uh, they needed to do something with data in more of an enterprise capacity. And uh, we're looking to kind of bring on this capability from, from the outside and, and, and 
bringing in a person to lead that and, and growing up a group that can do more of those kinds of things, but didn't necessarily have a real deep vision of exactly how that needed to manifest. And I think as I came in, I came in after they had been struggling with that problem for about six months, and I came in as a consultant in my previous firm at RGP. And uh, over time, uh, after spending about four months as a consultant, we ended up deciding to uh, kind of convert that position to, to a full-time role um, because they, they found that uh, the kind of um, ideas that we were able to develop while I was here and the kind of um, insight that I brought, brought to the problems that they had uh, were, were exactly what they were looking for. And so I think that um, you know, I had the opportunity, and it's a unique story in the way I came into the organization, but I think that hopefully the lessons that this organization has learned throughout this process will hopefully be things that um, people listening in today can, can apply to their, their own organizations and, and careers as well. Terrific. Well, we'll get into a lot of those questions shortly. Um, you mentioned it's a heavy uh, industry, heavy machinery uh, organization. I just love this slide from, from <laughs> the presentation with that rack of drill bits there. Um, that, that, those are some scary sized pieces of equipment. Yeah. Um, so it was. I love I loved this slide, so all these slides, are in the, and we're only going to show a few of them today, but I tried to bring in some pictures of some things at the CTA that people may not always have, have had access to see before. And so this picture was one I took on a tour of the uh, shop that fixes trains, and some of those drill bits, uh, the big ones at the top, are, are the, literally the size of an arm. And, and, I, and I didn't see the drill that those go into, but I'm sure that would be even more scary. <laughs> So uh, this was one of the, the first uh, slides you showed during your presentation in San Diego, and I, I thought it would be useful for you just to review these points because uh, they, they do provide a context for your perspective on some of the other questions we'll be looking at. So why don't you just run through these three points here? Definitely. So, so keep in mind that the context of this presentation was really around, you know, being a chief data officer, becoming a chief data officer. And I thought that for the people that might be in that room, they may be thinking, how do I become a chief data officer? And that's really what my first point is, is that that's not necessarily the question you want to be asking yourself. It, it, it's not a solution looking for how do I do that. It, it's really a, the best place for a chief data officer is when that's exactly the answer to the problems at hand. And in our organization at CTA, uh, it was the, the answer to the problems at hand because they really needed um, something to kind of string together the different data capabilities that they had in these in these small silos and have an, a, a group focused solely on amplifying those business capabilities that data can help drive uh, in a very uh, kind of universal way throughout the enterprise. And so that's really what I'm getting at is don't think about, like, like how do we get a CDO into this organization? Think about, does my organization need a, a chief data officer? And, and I'll kind of talk about some situations uh, in a little bit where, where they may not, where a chief data officer may not be uh, necessary. So the second point is really around um, the chief data officer is not an IT job. First and foremost, like I just mentioned, we amplify business capabilities through data. So data and you know information technology too. I mean, it's all about helping folks in a business do that business better. I go so far as to say the only value of data and data analytics is in the difference that of what your business can do with it versus what it can do without it. It's in that differential is the only place that us as a data analytics group can really gauge our success because otherwise we could produce a whole bunch of stuff but even if it's interesting and even if it's heavily used by people in the business, it may not be meaningful, may not be worth investing in because it's not actually driving business value. So it's really important to focus on that business side first, even though, in my third point, I come back to say, hey, the CDO is an IT job because ultimately you're leveraging technology, you're leveraging that technology amplifying power to do those things. And in, I, in another uh, presentation I gave uh, not too long ago where I, I kind of posited that instead of thinking of data as an asset, as something that just has mass and sits somewhere with inertia and all that, think of data more as energy. Data is a thing that you can apply to a situation to make something happen. It's a change agent. And that is really what our data analytics group and what my role is all about in our organization, is to be a change agent for the organization as a whole to figure out how can we be better at doing the buses, doing the trains, serving the people of Chicago and the outlying communities in the best way possible, leveraging the data and insights we can get from uh, the data throughout our organization. 
Well, I, I found myself quoting you later in the day uh, during one of the panel sessions on, on three or four occasions, um, both from that opening slide as well as from this one. So again, just from a, a contextual standpoint, I think some of these, these questions are really interesting to get your answers on. Um, so why don't I also invite you just to, to run through this slide here and, and give us your perspective on some of these questions. Why, why are CDOs a thing right now? Right, so I think that in, in the, role of the, uh, the role of a chief data officer, so the, re, the way I originally structured this slide was me asking the, the uh, people in the room uh, to comment on that. We don't have a forum right now where we can do that, so I'll give you, I'll give you my answers to it. So the, the role of the chief data officer, in my mind, is to be the kind of um, business advocate side of the IT coin. You know, so it, it's more saying, I don't think um, in a lot of cases our information technology organizations are as in tune with the business as they would like to be or have resource availability to be. And I think as if I'm focused solely, or not necessarily solely, but, but very heavily on what are the business implications of everything that we're doing, I can be a proxy to the business in, a, in an effective way as it comes to data and IT uh, strategy and tactics within an organization, how it influences projects, how it influences a queue of, of different things. So I think that the chief data officer is really about being a partner, um, and, and we'll talk about some organizational structure things in a little bit, but I think it's about being a partner to the IT organization um, and representing the business and the business interest in that and, and being able to do so and converse in a language that is familiar to everyone within the IT realm and then can be disseminated back out uh, on the business side as well. And I think it's really being that kind of translation agent uh, to IT, but also having that kind of vision of what's really important to the business and representing that as well. And obviously, I think this role um, you know, has always been important. I think it's, it's something that uh, we're now seeing, and I think if, if we look at that box on the bottom, it's really about the, the prominence of the importance is becoming greater and greater because of the capabilities of technology, because of the capabilities of data. If we're thinking about the, what we can do with these tools and the amplification or the energy that we can direct now is bigger and bigger and bigger with these, these kinds of massively um, powerful tools, if we don't get our calibration correct, then we're going to shoot it in the wrong spot. We're going to we're going to miss hit what we're aiming for, and we're be, we're doing it with ever bigger guns. And so I think that's really what it's about is to kind of take all of this potential and make sure we're aligning it properly to the business at hand. And so that's really what what the organizations can do with a chief data officer and and a, a functioning data analytics group is to apply to learn all of these new capabilities and link them effectively to the business and really interact and and take collaboration between information technology or between um, technology enabled groups and business. Uh, focused ones and make that as powerful as possible and really bring to those uh, collaboration sessions an understanding that we may have certain capabilities as a data analytics group where we can do kinds of analysis or we can build an enterprise warehouse or we can you know, do these kinds of visualizations and things like that, but they're not going to get us too far. And even if we're trying to do our best on behalf of the business to do the things that are going to impact the business most, you know who knows who is going to impact or what's going to impact the business most, it's the business. And that's really where you're having a conversation where you're really listening and really collaborating as opposed to, you know, talking at one another through requirements documents or things like that, which in the large scale IT types of programs, it's really difficult to get the kind of collaboration that we would like because the projects are so massive and the number of players and the, num and the, the kind of small slices of the overall insight available are spread among so many people. In a data world, in a data analytics world, if we can understand the real business needs and we have some really business-focused people in our data analytics group, if we can do that and appreciate what's going on for the business, we can do a lot more than we could if we were just saying, hey, business, tell us what kind of data analytics you want, we'll build it for you. That, that's going to break down. And I think that having these kinds of separate entities give us another shot at getting that kind of collaboration right. And so a chief data officer position really going to solve our problems. This is when I start really getting on my soapbox. If you didn't think I was there already, it's, it's maybe, it may solve our problems if you get the right 
people and the right vision and the right type of thing in, in place. But if you just say, hey, I'm going to give somebody a chief data officer title and hope they can figure it all out, that's not going to be really effective. The, the position, the title, none of that stuff is as important as the function that they, they perform. And I think one of the challenges that we have with chief data officers is that we've created this new kind of role. And in so many different businesses, it takes on such a different flavor that when you hear somebody's a chief data officer, you don't even know what that means. And, and even us as the experts in what chief data officers should be, we don't even have general agreement yet. And it's going to take time. It's the same thing that happened with chief information officers um, or other C-level positions or any position. You know, what does data scientist mean? We're going through a similar uh, kind of uh, evolution with that position as well. So ultimately, like, I'll just read my bottom point here. The, the data analytics capabilities are becoming more important but our current organizations are poorly suited to building and connecting the business to these capabilities. So hopefully I've provided a little bit of uh, context to what I mean in that box, but I think, I think hopefully that, that comes through. So I guess that means that the, the answer to the question about how do you get started as a chief data officer is going to be different in every case, but why don't we um, tell us a little bit about uh, your role. So you started as the CDO of the Chicago Transit Authority in March of this year, which, which um, in CDO terms is, is uh, uh, maybe uh, longer than many of the ones <laughs> that are currently in that role, because um, I, I don't think there are many who've had the position for more than a couple of years at this point. Can you describe how the CTA decided that they wanted to have the CDO role and why they ultimately appointed you to the, the job? Yeah, I, I will try to do justice to this. Um, I, I can't fully speak on the decision makers uh, because I was outside of, of some of that as a consultant. Um, but I think, you know, I was brought in as a consultant to help them figure out how to solve these data challenges, where they knew there were things that they wanted to do with data or things that they were struggling with in terms of gaining insight into their own business uh, that, that they knew there, were, there, there had to be a better way. Right, and so as a consultant, I came in and started learning what was what, what were the challenges. And one of the big ones was around our uh, fare system. Uh, there was kind of an infamous project that was uh, done, and uh, a new fare system with, called Ventra that was released a couple years ago. And there have been problems with it. There was there was a lot of issues with the rollout, and then there's been lingering problems uh, that have been uh, some both public facing and others that have been more uh, internal in terms of uh, our operations and the way. Uh, we can work with it. And one of the challenges with that was around data, and, and the CTA didn't have full database level access to that data. And so one of the things that we did while I was here as a consultant is we, we started getting that data in and doing something with it. And I think that as we started to gain some wins there, because I am coming back to your original question, um, as we started uh, gaining some wins there and starting to show, hey, here's how we can derive some value from this data, and here's a platform that we can put it in, and here's how um, people can connect to it, and we started solving problems that had been lingering for a couple of years, they said, hey, Anthony, why don't you come in and, and direct this group and, and do this stuff? And I said, okay, I'm, I'm interested in this, and in these challenges are certainly ones we're solving and that I would be proud to, to help uh, in any way I could. Um, but the way they were originally approaching the position was at a uh, director level, which would probably have not rolled up through IT directly, but I felt that um, would put them in a difficult position and, and in terms of the way the organization here is pretty hierarchical, uh, that a director level is going to report up through other departments. And what I felt was in something where you're trying to do so many things in a new way, that group would be very uh, challenged to be successful uh, when they're beholden to some other group. Plus, it, it's kind of difficult to remain independent if you are uh, reporting up through, say, a financial organization or, um, or IT or whatever. So there's always limited resources, there's, limited, there's a lot of politics and all of that. And so I said, we can have two conversations, because they kept asking if I would be interested, and I said, we can have a couple conversations. The first is around what the C, in my opinion, as a consultant and, and doing the best I can for you, uh, is, is what, what I think this group really needs to be successful. And it was really around trying to make sure the CTA who saw there was some great leadership, knew there was a problem, but was having trouble either hiring the right person for it or, or putting their finger on exactly how to structure that group and the way to make them successful. I wanted to help them with that first. And I said, hey, you know, let's talk about that. And then subsequently, or, or if you agree, or if we decide that this is the way you want to help structure that, if you think I might still be a candidate for that, we can talk about that separately. But I wanted to make sure that the decision to do the right thing wasn't 
done in a, in a conflict of interest scenario where I was saying, oh, I wanted to be a chief data officer, so that's the only thing I'm interested in. You know, I wanted to make sure that first and foremost, my client did the right thing and creating a group that could be successful. And then if they felt I could be successful helping to lead that group, then so much the better. And that's kind of the way it all panned out. We had some conversations around it. We said, um, you know, this is how it be, should be structured. Uh, the, the way the position ended up falling out uh, was, uh, you know, it's, it's my position it sits at the same level of the organization um, in terms of hierarchy as the CIO. So she's a, a peer and a, and a great partner of mine, um, and we, we really see eye to eye on a lot of the strategy going forward, but it allows my group to have the independence to do the things that we feel is best um, versus having to go up through and compete with uh, specific resources that are allocated to IT as a whole, for example, or in some other area. And I think that um, as we've seen over the last few months, and I think my team would uh, concur with that, um, that independence has really helped us move things along um, in many ways, whereas otherwise things could have gotten bogged down and, and um, you know, old ways of, of doing certain things. So I think that that's been very useful. Um, and right now I report up through um, the chief internal auditor who has both audit, I think of it kind of as a professional services type of consulting type organization where he's kind of the, the lead partner that has both the um, account or the um, auditing wing, uh, the accounting auditing wing under him, as well as the um, consulting wing. Even though we don't have like the actual accounting group here, um, that's out in finance, but he has that kind of dual role. And I think that fits for now, but we've had talks where that, um, you know, we're kind of in this incubation period where we're still growing up the team, we're still getting kind of our sea legs. Eventually we're gonna move this out of audit and hopefully have it reporting directly into the president's office somewhere, uh, because then uh, the audit group would maintain full independence and would be able to audit our activities as well right now there would be a conflict of interest and we'd have to go externally for, for full audits of our group. So that's kind of where we are right now, but it was because of, you know, the specifics of the situation that eventually led us to that path. We didn't have the end point fully in mind as we worked through it. That's how we got to it again. Sure. Um, so I'm going to ask you to just explain in a minute uh, how the CDO role is defined vis-a-vis uh, -vis the CIO role, but before we uh, do that. I just want to invite folks uh, who are in the session today. Uh, if you have questions, uh, type them in the Q&A box on the bottom right of your WebEx screen. Uh, we will take questions as they arise uh, if, if you have something, and we'll also be leaving some time at the end of the session to to go through uh, all of them. So, Anthony, um, you mentioned that your uh, your position is on, on the same level in the organization as the CIO. Um, how are those two roles demarcated, please? Yeah. So the way I the way I consider it um, is, you know, the, the CIO has an, a pretty enormous organization and is really uh, doing a lot for the individual source systems, the the, the systems that um, eventually provide data to our kind of analytics world, but also are doing much of the work of, of the CTA. I mean, she has the um, Oracle ERP platform, as well as countless other systems that are doing things for the buses and trains and uh, facilities management and operations. All of these things are, you know, relatively discrete systems, but there are so many of them. They share various resources across the IT organization to, to keep maintained, uh, to ensure that there's, uh, you know, maintenance schedules, to make sure that they're, they're supported properly and, and all of those things. So she's got her, her work uh, uh, really cut out for her. And I think that it, it, it kind of is a good example of why it can be very difficult to create the kind of group that we have within the, the context of an IT organization. Because by comparison, our role as change agents in the organization is, you know, when it comes to data analytics, the thing that I think about is, is anything, as soon as we're looking at uh, doing analysis around things that have already happened, or we need to bring data together between multiple different systems, or that we have a kind of specific request for information that can be fed to a business unit, or we need to be able to provide um, you know, an interactive tool to get to a bunch of different kinds of information. It's about taking certain things that have patterns of consistency among those different individual systems, but mostly when you bring them together, the kinds of analysis, the kinds of capabilities you may need to look at across different data sets, that's where my team really gets involved. It's really around saying, okay, how can we, from an enterprise perspective, 
leverage information and make our business better, which is a really fundamentally uh, different kind of role than the much, much more operations-focused role that most IT organizations are, are consumed by. And, and I, you know, say in, in uh, a speech recently, you know, is, is how many uh, IT organizations have the resources that they need to do what they need to do. I, I haven't found one yet. You know, and so they're always just trying to keep, you know, things secure. And I mean, I, I work very closely with our, our chief information security officer uh, who sits in IT. And, you know, there's a million great ideas that he has that, you know, we have to pick and choose our spots very carefully in what we can actually fund. And, and that kind of um, operations mentality is, is crucial to be successful successful in an IT organization. And um, in our organization in, in data analytics, it's really around saying what can we build new that can amplify the things that already are existing in those systems where we can get the most value out of them however possible. And that's, I think, um, really where that kind of good partnership between myself and the CIO allows us to do some great things that neither one of us could do on our own. You know, I'm able to uh, kind of build some new stuff without being encumbered by some of the keeping the lights on uh, work that has to be done, and she's able to um, allow us to, to kind of go out there and test new things and bring new capabilities into the organization that she just doesn't have the resource headroom uh, to be able to, to take on uh, while there's so many other things uh, that need to be addressed just from a keeping everything going uh, perspective as well. Okay, so we have a, a small flurry of questions here related to structure. Uh, I'll dwell on those just for a minute. So uh, one question is, given a, a company with data functions that are fragmented across the organization and not meeting business needs, how do you think an organization can gain awareness that it needs to bring those functions together with a chief data officer role? to improve those capabilities of managing and leveraging data? That's an interesting, that's an interesting question, and I, and I can talk about it from the perspective of I don't like building a huge process before getting something done. And I also think about there are enormous amounts of data analytics capabilities throughout the CTA that have no formal tie-in with the data analytics group. Um, and so I think, like from my perspective, there's an opportunity if you're creating a centralized group that's focused on data analytics, you have a big challenge in getting people to understand what it is you intend to do with that group. And I think, um, you know, you want to start showing what capabilities you can drive, but recognize that those data folks throughout your organization exist for a reason. And if you can create a data analytics group that has um, an ability to amplify their own capabilities throughout the organization or, or if you've pulled some of them into that group, is finding a way that you can create things that add even more business value than they were able to do on their own and can be applied throughout the rest of the organization. I think it's an efficiency play where you say, hey, if you have a group where an individual is doing all this data analytics stuff and you have another group where another individual is doing very similar but with a different data set, there, there, there's synergies there. There's an ability to do things more efficiently. So that could be part of your uh, business case to senior leadership. I think one of the things, that, and we would get to it no matter what, but it's really around um, – you know, the uh, effectiveness, the efficiency of these different groups and of the people that you have. And if you don't have the executive sponsorship or the executives that see, hey, we see the inefficiencies in this business, or you can't convince them of that, then you're going to have a really tough time selling a chief data officer role. The chief data officer role is a, is a culmination of a bunch of understanding, not a put it in place and hope they figure it out later. Thanks. So uh, you've been referring a lot to analytics as you're describing your role, um, uh, but in some organizations, the, the primary responsibility is governance and, and quality and uh, just sort of getting data into, into tape. Uh, can you define your role a little bit in terms of the emphasis of analytics versus other functions like governance? Okay, um, so a little background. So my, my job as a consultant uh, before I came to the CTA was in large part to um, build data governance practices to execute data governance and related projects, you know, metadata management, data quality, and things like that. So I am no stranger uh, to data governance. And I joke now because now that I'm in a position where it's largely my mandate to make sure we're doing data governance, I don't want to buy the thing that I used to sell. 
And that puts me in a precarious position because I don't want to be hypocritical about things, but at the same rate, I want to be very pragmatic about the resources that I'm applying. And so the way I look at governance and, and some of the kind of the, that, that DEMA framework thing, which I think is incredibly valuable, is that I'm trying to apply those layers in a kind of just-in-time manner. So because we're setting new precedents, we're building new capabilities, I'm trying to establish some good practices aligned with those first so that we can then use that as a seed to the rest of the organization. So this is not going to be applicable in a lot of organizations because you'll already have some sort of data governance or some sort of formalized quality or metadata or master data types of programs. We didn't have any of that at the CTA, so I'm growing all of that stuff as well. And the last thing I'm going to do is put a lot of my limited resources into a large umbrella of data governance to govern everything I might you know, encounter down the road. I'm first going uh, to make sure that I'm building something of value and then I'm governing it appropriately as that maturity uh, continues to increase the number of people it involves and it continues to increase. One of the areas of governance that we're really actively working on right now is how we're managing the uh, security and the access permissions to various parts of our ever-growing cloud environment. So we're doing a lot of analytics in the AWS platform, specifically Redshift. And so this has never been done in the organization before. Everything's encrypted and compressed, and we're getting enormous performance out of it. But because we have this sandbox, which is ultimately infinitely scalable, we need to make sure that as it infinitely scales, we haven't set a bad precedent in terms of how we assign access rights or how we secure different things or how we make sure things are always encrypted or any of that stuff. So those are the areas that I'm making sure that I and my team have the right policies around so we self-govern. And then as more and more folks are impacted by what we're building, we're going to make sure that those governance policies uh, apply to them as well. But right now we're in such a kind of startup build it mentality that the governance aspects are kind of secondary. But I mean, I had a meeting with, uh, specifically around metadata management with, with one of the people on my team this morning because now that we've got something, we need to make sure we're really documenting it appropriately and governing it, uh, especially as it, it continues to grow very quickly. So I think it's taking that just in time, making sure that at every step, you know, it's an ag agile uh, mentality where at every step, deliver value. To make sure that the, the next thing that your team does is going to have an immediate impact to how, you know, whatever your equivalent is to, you know, putting buses and trains um, out in service. You know, that, that ultimately is, is how you got to govern where you apply any resources uh, from a strategic perspective. Okay. So um, there's a couple of questions submitted around roles, which we'll get to in just a minute. And uh, before we do, um, you mentioned uh, that DEMA framework thing. Um, you're probably referring to the DEMA DM box, the, the body of yes. knowledge document. Yes. Which is, uh, which is available at uh, DEMA.org for anybody who's interested in following up on that. Uh, somebody had also asked about educational resources earlier. Um, uh, I assume that you would include the DM box as part of uh, the, the educational resources you'd recommend. Um, and uh, we might also return to that question a little bit later. So I've, I've brought us forward uh, another of the slides that you presented in San Diego is your data analytics framework. And um, I'm going to suggest that you address this at the moment, and then we can come back to a couple of these questions about roles. So let's take it through the framework that's on the screen right now. Absolutely. So I think it's a good lead-in to talk about, because I assume that some of the folks on this call are going to have that familiarity with the, the DEMA DMBOC, um, and that is definitely what I was referring to. I think it's a wonderful reference architecture for uh, data types of, of uh, use. Um, I use it heavily as a, as a consultant, you use it heavily now. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to make something like, if you, if you need something that's a good reference architecture, that's great. If you need a sleep aid, that's also great if you try to read that cover to cover. And so what I wanted to do was, come up with a way that's a little bit more accessible for less data-focused individuals to understand what in the world we're trying to do. And that's where we came up with this data analytics framework. And so the first step, and so if you look at the full screen, the, the ultimate goal here, like we've talked about already, is, is business impact. It's, it's what can you do with it versus what can you do without it. And, and knowing that is really ultimately the end. 
But if I'm trying to drive business impact, there's a few things that have to happen before I have a hope of making the impact that I desire. So the first thing, and, and this was, you know, has been on much of our focus, is, is around availability, data availability. It's, I can't do much with data if I can't get to it. So like our fair system, where much of the data was resident with the vendor, we had to get it so that we could access it, so we could make it available, so we could start to see where is value, where might it not be right, where, where might there be information that we didn't even know we were getting. You know, starting to look at that from just get people access to it so they can start doing what they do best and bringing their business knowledge to bear on what that data is. If we, if we lock data so down with a bunch of um, database administrators or data developers that aren't really bringing it forward to the business, we're missing a great opportunity. So once we have available data, the, the next focus is on, okay, understanding from a quality perspective, what do we need to do with that data? Or how good does that data need to be to drive the things we want to do from a business impact perspective? And I wrote a whole white paper at my old uh, consulting firm around strategic data quality. And the, the, the bottom line of that is to say, hey, we, we have, a lot of organizations have this mentality that if, if the data is not perfect, then it's wrong. And we've always got to be going for perfection. And I said, that's crazy because, A, you're never going to get there. It's never gotten there. You could always go to another layer of precision. You could always do something more to make it better. And frankly, nobody has enough resources to do that. And so if we do that in some data, we're just going to end up not looking at anything with some other data that's really important, too. So what I've said is, hey, understand the quality thresholds. So how good of a data quality do you need to make the decision or to drive the activity that you need to do? And if you need 80% quality, however you want to measure it or however you want to assign a score to it, I don't care, but come up with what that is and know, hey, do I have enough? Do I not have enough? How important is the decision that we're trying to make? And be strategic about how you apply those resources, the limited resources, to improving quality in the right places. If you make something 90% quality that only needs to be 80% to drive a decision, then you've wasted energy. You've wasted resources that could have been applied to something else. So really think about that. Push back on a business and say, hey, if you're a marketing department, do you really need to know 90% whether or not these people are riding the train to work or whether these ride, or they're riding a train to um, you know, a social gathering? Could, could you make a good marketing decision with 60% knowledge or 70% knowledge? What is that threshold? So then if you've gone through that exercise, on any given amount of data, then adoption may occur. So the whole point is if you're going to build it, build something that people want to use. So it's necessary but not sufficient that people find it useful and interesting. It's, it's absolutely critical to business impact that they find it useful and interesting. They could still get no business impact out of it if they find it useful and interesting, but you've got to at least get that. So the adoption is all around that useful and interesting thing. Are people going to use what we're building for them? Do they think it's going to impact the business in, in the end? So making sure that you're calibrating at every step and building, using this as kind of a building box approach to realize the next one doesn't happen without the one in front of it, and ultimately nothing's of value unless we make it all the way to business impact. And so that's where I'd much rather take a smaller data set, drive it all the way to business impact, and then add to it, versus spending the next 12 months building the best enterprise data warehouse, driving no actual adoption or quality over those 12 months, trying to do everything at once, and then hoping I'll flip a switch and miraculously transform the business. I just don't believe in that. And this analytics framework uh, kind of comes from my core beliefs on how you should go about adding value to an organization through data. Okay. So we're going to come back to this question about um, roles and, and organizational structure. And I, I want to pre preface your remarks just by saying that um, when uh, John Lavely and I did some research uh, seven or eight months ago around the role of the CDO, we found a vast difference in the size of CDO organizations, um, partly because they were so young. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of CDO, quote unquote, organizations start out as one person as a pilot project, and then second year in, uh, they start to get some budget and some personnel. Others start out with uh, numerous people right away. Uh, but everyone is different, so uh, I, I think to Anthony's earlier point about uh, along similar lines, it's, it's a little dangerous to sort of um, use one size fits all for every organization. But Anthony, why don't you talk about the organization that you have at the C CTA? Um, in particular, what are the, the key roles and functions that report to you? What sort of job functions do you have on your team? Um, give us some perspective. 
Sure. So I, I definitely agree with everything you said. And, and in our organization, uh, like I mentioned before, we have a very much a startup mentality where we know we're kind of growing this organically. And it's so core to, uh, you know, strategy of the organization that it's something too, you've got to be very careful in where uh, you outsource it, especially in terms of the leadership positions. So in, in my organization in particular, and, and keep in mind, we've doubled in size um, in, the, in the three months that I've been there. Um, we're currently leveraging some contracted resources, um, but are hopefully going to transition more of those to, to full-time positions. They're operating in a full-time capacity right now, so we'll just talk about them as roles on the team, because I think that's the most useful. Uh, so right now, um, I have a total of uh, six people uh, reporting up to me. Um, and uh, the first is, is a senior manager who is uh, incredibly connected with the business. He's been around the CTA for a year and a half and has uh, really been a, a key player in, in understanding uh, some of the very deep uh, needs of the fair system side, as well as being very much engaged uh, on the um, on the, the various business-facing aspects of, of data throughout the organization is an incredible resource and kind of um, leads on a day-to-day -day basis the activities of the team as a whole. Um, he, he brings more of that, that business side than the, than the technology side. I also have a, um, one person who's a contractor uh, who is a kind of very senior business analyst. He does a lot of our special projects and is currently helping to lead from a data perspective a large effort, um, almost the same size as a fair system rollout, but it's all internal around a lot of our operations uh, capabilities with a, a new platform that's going in uh, to replace uh, many systems that we've relied on in the past. Um, then we have a um, we have a data scientist uh, who's uh, leading a lot of our efforts around uh, reporting um, and uh, some business intelligence, uh, creating some models uh, for our supply chain group, as well as uh, assisting in, in a variety of other capacities. Uh, and then uh, two data analysts who are kind of um, more uh, our traditional like BI analysts, uh, reporting analysts who are creating a lot of reports, doing a lot of the kind of regular reporting as we're building up more sophisticated capabilities, they're kind of the glue that holds a lot of the things together. Once we build them, they make sure that we've, we're getting them out to people in a consistent manner, that we're starting to have a, a consistent service delivery of data, services, and offerings to the organization. Uh, they, they make a lot of that go on. And then the final person is a person who um, is really our one technical uh, lead other than myself. He uh, is a, a senior AWS architect developer, and he really um, has done an incredible job helping us uh, operationalize a lot of the stuff that I originally built as a consultant uh, in our Amazon uh, AWS and, and Redshift platform. So he's really focused on automation. We're doing a lot of the, the data loads from our fare system uh, are completely automated now. Uh, he's adding um, a bunch of capabilities uh, and, and helping to, to lead us as we bring in a visualization tool uh, from the technical perspective. So that's kind of where we are right now. I think we're looking at bringing in a um, project manager and agile coach uh, position. Uh, that's one that we have on our short list of things that we're trying to bring into the team immediately. We'd also be looking at bringing on some additional um, data developer and, and AWS developer type of roles. And I would say just if, if others out there find themselves going the AWS route, it's very difficult in the marketplace to find people with specified AWS talent. I find that a lot of BI-focused individuals that have background in the Microsoft stack, uh, I find that that skill set translates pretty well to what they're doing um, in the Redshift environment, some of their RDS stuff, especially if they have a little bit of like Python programming and things like that. You may not find an AWS developer out there, but you may be able to find uh, some people whose skills are really transferable and um, you know, that may be able to be available at a, at a lower price point than somebody who has a lot of dedicated AWS experience because the, the platforms just haven't been out there that long uh, to get enough uh, experience out in the marketplace. Okay, and just uh, for anybody who's not familiar, um, AWS, of course, is Amazon Web Services, and Redshift is their uh, data warehouse product. So it's a reasonable summary of that. Um, okay, so we have some other questions about uh, tools and, and structure. Um, I'm going to skip over the tool ones for now just because they're not quite as relevant to the, the topic we're dealing with today, but maybe we can deal with those um, in some of our follow-up. And 
As we only have 15 minutes left, I want to invite anybody who does have questions to try to get those in now because we have a, a short backlog here. Um, I, I had a question which might provide some um, context to some of these other queries that people have is, is how is your how is your workload or the projects that you work on um, determined? Do you come up with them? Does, does the CEO send down a wish list? Uh, how do you decide what you're going to work on? That's a, and, and I think you've, you've touched on part of the issue why we want to bring in um, some more agile practices to the team is that right now, because we're kind of the startup mentality, we're, we're moving in a million directions at once. And it's difficult for me to be uh, fully transparent and, and even know to some extent exactly what everybody's working on at any given time and be able to kind of report up the, the uh, so chain of command, you know, what it is that our team is focused on. I, I articulate priorities. Um, I share them both uh, to my superiors as well as to my team and make sure that they understand what it is that are the most important things that we're focusing on right now. But I want to get to a point where we can measure productivity better um, and performance against those priorities because there's not, without some process, it's difficult to calibrate. Um, so that is a constant challenge for us. And, and I think part of it uh, that's helped is that we have a, a daily standard end up uh, where we talk about everything that's been going on yesterday, things that we're going to do today, and any, any blockers that we have, uh, which is, you know, kind of a, a very basic agile practice, but I think we need a little bit more maturity there before that um, you know, really takes on. But I think that the, the point is, is that as a data analytics group and in the kind of level of maturity that we are, we're constantly being derailed, sorry, no pun intended, um, from what we had planned on uh, doing. Uh, to, to take on some, you know, more immediate um, uh, project of the day or our, you know, changing priorities. And so having that flexibility while still being uh, responsive to our set priorities, uh, that's a constant challenge. And it's, get, it's getting more and more difficult as our team continues to grow. So I don't, I don't know that I have a great answer for that. I'd, I'd kind of like to ask uh, others in the group if, if they have some advice uh, in terms of how to do that. Okay. Uh, there is a question also about the relationship between your office and um, either data governance councils or steering committees or data stewards within the business. Um, do those exist within the CTA and do you have a relationship with them? Yeah, so we don't, we don't have a formal data governance um, council or um, you know, body with that, that name to it, but we do have some senior leadership uh, groups that we are engaging with to um, make sure that uh, what we're doing, our priorities and, and kind of the, the vision and strategy going forward align with the organizational interests and making sure that we're responsive. And so we have a loose group of a, a kind of a data um, advisory uh, group is, is really what it is. Um, but we have pretty good autonomy otherwise to make sure that as long as we're aligning and, and communicating effectively what we're doing and, and what our priorities as we see them are, um, you know, we've, we've found that that's been pretty effective. But it's something that we're looking to formalize more and more um, as we continue to mature. Uh, and as what we're producing, we've, we've been so focused on this development side, we've now kind of turned a corner in that we're now bringing forward a lot of the capabilities to others in the organization. And I think it's going to be more and more important to help make sure the other senior leaders know, hey, these are the kinds of things that your group may benefit from. Let's make sure we're engaging everywhere appropriate uh, to, to leverage these capabilities wherever we can in the organization. So again, it's, it's something where we're in that relatively early maturity um, point where we haven't had that level of interaction and the organization just hasn't had those groups existing before. And in some cases, we're creating those groups um, as part of uh, that maturing process. Yeah, um, that was another of the things that John and I found uh, in talking to people is that you know, oftentimes the CDO role or organization um, evolves uh, quite rapidly over the first year or so of its existence, and can, the structure can change, the priorities can change as, as everybody who is inside and outside that organization kind of figures out what works and what doesn't. Um, there are a couple of other questions here about uh, tools, including um, uh, DMBOK and the uh, CMMI data maturity model. I, um, I, I'm going to ask those question is to be patient. We'll, we'll try to get to them at the end, but there's um, 
Uh, another slide I, I really want Anthony to address um, as we get close to our time, which is um, what sort of lessons has he learned so far? So, Anthony, why don't you take us through this final slide here? Right. So, I, and, and some of these we've, we've touched on. So, the first, nobody really knows what a chief data officer does until you tell them. I mean, it, it's a new position, right? It, and it's different in every organization. And, and when you have this role in, in an organization like the CTA, where um, a lot of things are pretty regimented and very traditional, um, you know, it, people are just confused. And, and I think that um, it's up to you to determine what that position means in your organization. And then a key piece of that and a key piece of being successful in that role is to make sure you communicate effectively and market the value that you're adding to those in the organization. Because if, and it's true of any role, really, even if they, people think they know what uh, that person does, we tend to um, oversimplify the things we don't fully understand. And unless we've been there and had that role and done that in that organization, well, there's probably a lot of things we don't really understand about it. So it's, it's on us as CDOs to make sure that people understand uh, what it is that we're focused on, what it is that we're doing, and how we can help them, really. Um, you know, and, and until you do that, people are going to uh, think you're you're coming in and hey now all data analytics must go through the data analytics organization and, and that's not the case and until you realize hey I'm an advocate for what you're doing I'm here to help amplify what you're doing and if we work together I might be able to save you four hours of data manipulation and let you do twice as much analysis in the kinds of things that you're doing and and that only comes from being able to connect with people and start to understand and have empathy for what it is and the challenges that they have. I mean, I think if there was a number one skill that you would need as a, as a chief data officer, it's, it's empathy. It's really care about making the business better, making you making people's lives easier, making it easier for them to do the things they need to do. Because I know, like, I can go help our planning group or our performance management group in, in enormous ways, but there is no chance that I could do as good of a job as they could do at planning or at performance management. And so it's knowing that and, and recognizing that my role here is as an assistant, not as a dominator, dominator of anything. That's really the important thing. Now that said, you know the, the the point around don't being afraid to rock the boat is, hey, I'm a, I'm in a very old organization that has a lot of things that are pretty set in their way, and, and I've been told and, and been very much given the mandate that I have to be a change agent in this organization, and the only way to do that is to push people and get them a little bit outside of their comfort zone, and recognize that sometimes in being that business amplifier, I may be amplifying things that shouldn't, you know, people would rather not have amplified. And that's where um, you know, you've got to be judicious and, and knowing where to pick your spots um, because, you know, if you, if you try to change everything all at once and, and you know, even though you work with people, you, you have to recognize that sometimes um, that there, there are immovable objects in some organizations or, 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 and, or things that are, have enough inertia that it may be better to just work around them than to try to push them through. And that's really what that Pick Your Battles Accordingly is about. But the, the always collaborate, sometimes compromise, but never betray your values is really important to me. Like, there are certain things that I think are the right way, and there's certain things that I think I know are the right way, and there's, there's things that I can't ethically bring myself to do otherwise. And, and it's making sure that though I want to compromise, though I want to work with folks and make sure that there's, there's good ways ahead, as a leader, sometimes I have to know, is this something that I want to do, or is this something that is essential to do either because of its need uh, that's coming from the business or because it's ethically uh, the only answer to a certain circumstance. And as you get into these leadership roles where there's not someone telling you what's right and wrong necessarily, you have to have that conviction and you have to be able to say, hey, I know this is the right way. Um, I, I, can't, I can't betray my values uh, and go against that, um, you know, especially as, as you're trying to build some new capabilities. Um, you know, but then, too, like once you get the position, don't change too much. And that, that can be read two ways intentionally. One is whatever got you there, keep doing. It, it, you know, don't become a different person because you have a, a chief data officer title and people might look at you a little bit differently than they used to. Um, you know, recognize that if you've been successful enough, if you've been able to make enough impact in an organization where they bestow this kind of responsibility on you, um, don't, don't think that doing something entirely different is going to change that. I think the best way to become a chief data officer is to be a chief data officer. You know, come in and make it your personal mission to fix those things. Make it your personal mission to solve those data problems in one way or another, grassroots effort, whatever it takes. Find a way to make people's lives better using data. You'll find your way to a chief data officer role someday. 
you know, and then you know, ultimately your role as a leader of people trumps everything else. Is you know, it, it the data side of what I do. I, I occasionally am able to get into some some deep data stuff, but most of what I do is making sure that I'm managing well and making sure that I'm providing the right resources or the the right vision and encouraging my team in the right way, making sure they stay motivated, making sure they understand that there's a point to all of this, making sure that if they, they don't realize that there's somebody else they need to talk to, that I make sure they talk to them, and making sure that I'm protecting my people when they're out there trying to be change agents, and they are not going to get everything right either, and that if they make a misstep, that I can shoulder the burden of whatever happened, um, and that I can protect them so that they can do what they do best. Because I think ultimately, you know, when you're a chief data officer or when you're any kind of manager, it's, you know, about helping people do what they do best and making them as powerful and successful in doing what they do best as possible. And, and that goes throughout the entire organization, wherever data get in, gets involved, which is in most places, you know, if you can amplify your business uh, capabilities and business success doing that, then, you know, so much the better, and then, then you're on the right track. Okay, so uh, that actually is a great answer to the question that was submitted here. Um, uh, to what extent should your core expertise be in building analytics to create business value versus program management experience? Um, uh, the question is asking, you know, is that an 80-20 split, 50-50? Um, uh, do, do you have any uh, any some some response to that from the hip about uh, the relative importance of those that experience or? I think exposure to all of it is important. I think I think you you have a huge blind spot if you haven't had some exposure to all of it. I think that being an expert in something is important as well, and getting deep into something is is important as well. But I think it's less important the specifics on that. I feel like I I really rely a lot on a lot of the deep technical work that I've done. I mean, I've built data warehouses from scratch. I was able to code our first uh, alpha version of AWS Redshift environment. It was able to, like, leapfrog some things. But could a person who's never written a SQL query be a good chief data officer? I'm sure they could. You know, I don't, I don't know that I'm qualified to determine that. That's kind of a meta level of understanding of chief data officers that I, don't, I won't pretend to have. But I do feel like, you know, be good at what you do. Don't, don't deny what your aptitudes and what your specialties are. I hope you have some. Um, but then find great people that do other things. I mean, I wouldn't be, um, and my team wouldn't be successful if we didn't have some of the people that we have on this team now because they bring stuff to this equation that I certainly don't. And that's where, you know, I feel like I'm very fortunate to have good people around me to do so many things that I can't do myself. Um, I'm constantly learning from them too. So I think it's a, if you have the opportunity to do this, or you're building up to that opportunity to do it, be great at what it is that you're great at and find great people that can complement it well, form a team and, and you know, change the world. So uh, I'm gonna use the moderator's prerogative here and just uh, ask you one final question. Uh, have you made any mistakes so far? What, what would you do differently? And, and that only needs to be a very short answer. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's you know, it's, it, despite my attempts to do so, there have been a couple times where I pushed too hard or I, I had a blind spot where I didn't realize that a thing that I or somebody on my team was going to do was going to cause a lot of grief for others in the organization where it wasn't my intent, but that was the outcome. And so I've had to um, you know, respond to that a couple times. And, and I think it's, it's just making sure that I've done every bit of diligence that I can to avoid inadvertent challenges, especially on the people side, because the last thing I want to do is, is make people, um, you know, feel like we're, we're taking something of theirs when we're really here to, to help amplify whoever we can find in this organization. And um, there's been a couple circumstances where I wish I had that opportunity back. Um, I imagine that despite my best efforts, there'll be more of those. But I think that if I could do over a couple of those things where I accidentally stepped on toes that I didn't mean to step on, that, that would be my best answer to that. Okay. We're going to have to wrap things up here. Um, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And uh, Eric's going to tell everybody in a minute uh, what they'll be receiving in a couple of days. I just want to reiterate an offer I made right before the broadcast is that uh, if you're at all interested in uh, either of our summer conferences in San Jose, August 18 through 20, that's the Dataversity NoSQL Now or Smart Data Conferences, just send me an email 
to tonyofdataversity.net, and I'll send you that guest pass. Uh, Anthony, thank you again, and Eric, over to you. Yes, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Anthony. Uh, really great presentation. Um, just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recording of today's webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and we will send out a follow-up email to all of you who registered to let you know the links and other requested information. Thank you again for attending today's webinar. We hope to see you next time, and please have a great day and a very safe Fourth of July weekend. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Anthony. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys.